Good morning again. Uh, if you're in the cafe, come on through. We're going to start uh, with um, a reading of God's Word in just a moment, but I'm excited to be here to uh, continue our Bible series. We're in the book of 1 Corinthians, and uh, we're in a series called Church in the Wild. And over the last few chapters, the last few weeks, we've been peering in on the Apostle Paul, who's writing a letter to a church that he planted in a city called Corinth. And what we've seen so far is uh, the Apostle Paul dealing like a father with his kids with a bunch of issues that have come up in the life of the church. And he's dealt with such things as divisions in the church. Uh, He's talked about spiritual immaturity. He's talked about celebrity Christian culture. He's talked about unity in the church, healthy leadership. And the most important thing is that all churches should be built on the foundation of the cross. So he's essentially building this church again from the bottom up. He is a spiritual architect. He's re-architecting the culture of this community because he's noticed that it's drifted from its original design. And here we find ourselves in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, and we really come to the crescendo, the pinnacle, as it were, of Paul's argument. We come to the why. Why? We come to the why. How many of you know it's so important to have a why in your life? It's so important to know your why, why you're here, what you are called to do. Vision is vital for a life well lived. People perish for lack of purpose, the Bible says. So uh, vision and knowing your why is so important. And Paul lays out a stunning vision, a why for the church. Why is he dealing with all of these issues? And if you want it in a nutshell, it's this. The church is a temple. The church is a temple. I really only have one point this morning, and it's this. The church is a temple. Let's read from 1 Corinthians 3, 16 to 23. The words will be on the screen behind me. So what it says, verse 16, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. Do not deceive yourselves. If any of you think you are wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then... No more boasting about human leaders. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All are yours and you are of Christ and Christ is of God. The key verses I want to hang today's message on is verse 16 and 17. Let me read them again. Don't you know, whole vineyard, that you yourselves are God's temple? And that God's spirit dwells in your midst. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that it is truth. It's a light into our path. It's a lamp to our feet. And we ask that you would speak, you would breathe in this moment, God. Your word says the spirit of God is in our midst right now. And so we just echo the words of that last song, come and move, Lord. Come and move. We long to see you with greater clarity. We long to open our hearts with greater purity. Spirit of God, have your way. Amen. Turn to your neighbor this morning and say, we are a temple. We are a temple. Now, there are many names for the church, the body of Christ throughout the Bible. Let me give you a few. Uh, The people of God have been called uh, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, a chosen people, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a people owned by God, God's family, God's field, God's vineyard, God's home, God's branch, God's flock, God's fold, God's inheritance, God's dwelling place, a light in the darkness, a city on a hill. I like this one from Revelation, a golden candlestick. It's pretty awesome, isn't it? And many more. But here in this passage, Paul gives us another description, and it's this temple. Temple. I imagine if I was going to ask every single person in this room, give me a one-word description of what the church is, I don't know if any of us would use the word temple. Many of us may use the phrase family or home. 
But Paul wants us to see that the church is a temple. It is old-fashioned language. It's historical. It feels a bit Jewish, maybe. We, we miss the potency, I think, of this word. But I believe that God wants to open our eyes and our hearts in this season to recognize in his design, his divine design for our church to be a temple. So what is a temple? Here is my working definition is this. A temple is a place where God dwells. A place where God dwells, where God inhabits, where God is manifestly present. That's it. A temple is a place built to host the presence of God. We are a temple. This is not, I am a temple. Paul talks about, I am a temple of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 6. We'll get on to that. This is talking about us together here in this room. We see temples throughout the story of Scripture from the very beginning to the very end, beginning in the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden was the original temple. It was a place where heaven and earth overlapped, where God dwelled in the midst of his people. The Bible says that God walked with Adam in the garden. It was a picture of how life was always meant to be with God. And then the fall happened. Adam and Eve sinned. It sent fractures and splinters throughout humanity and creation. Humanity was expelled from Eden, but God wasn't finished with us. He kept finding ways to draw near and pursue us and build places of habitation. He built in the Old Testament, you can read about it, the tabernacle, and then later the temple itself in Jerusalem. These places were representative of union of heaven and earth. The presence of God was there, but really it was just a shadow. Sin was still a barrier, and so humanity had all these religious routines to go through in order to enter the presence of God, but even then it felt just out of arm's reach. They had to go through a priest, a mediator. They had to do offerings and sacrifices, and it all felt slightly out of touch. And then 2,000 years ago, Jesus comes on the scene and changes the game. How many of you know Jesus always changes the game? And he comes and he brings the presence of God. He brings the rule of God in a new way. He comes and in the words of John, in Jesus, God makes his home among us. The original language there, in the original language, actually says that God tabernacles among us. In other words, Jesus became the temple. He became the place on earth where heaven and earth overlapped and he began to manifest his rule and reign, his his presence on the earth. And then Jesus, as he died, as the better offering, the final offering, the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, signifying that now there is no distance, no separation for those in Christ between humanity and the presence of God. And then Jesus, by his Holy Spirit, built some new temples And these temples were no longer bound by bricks and mortar. They were no longer constrained to physical buildings and the holy of holies. These new temples were now people, communities, churches, us. It's a stunning reality and it brings some significant implications for how we think about what we are doing here, right right here, right now in this place. And, And my first real reflection on Church being a temple is this, that church is a place of habitation. Church is a place of habitation. I love this verse. Um, Paul says this, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? He's talking here to the body gathered, to, to moments like we find ourselves here this morning. You see, our gatherings, church, are never meant to be mundane moments of religious routine. Nor are they supposed to be uh, crowd-pleasing performance shows. A lot of Christians see church as a social club, as a box-ticking exercise to make God pleased with me, as a, uh, one of many things that I could possibly do on a Sunday if I can be bothered, if I'm not going to visit friends or see family or whatever. Paul says, guys, if you think that that's what church is meant to be, you're missing the point. You are a temple and the Spirit of God dwells in your midst. Let me say, if that's not a good enough reason to come to church and bring everyone that you know into the presence of God, I don't know what is. 
I love the language of the Spirit being in our midst. Because that's not safe language, is it? It's not like he lives in our hearts, he's a theoretical exercise, he'll keep quiet and let us get on with our agenda and our meetings, he's in our midst. Which means he's really here. He's present in the room, literally. He's among us, the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is in the room. He's at work, he's listening, he's calling, he's speaking, he's convicting, he's responding to our hunger, he's moving where he's invited, he's healing, he's bringing freedom, salvation, deliverance. The Spirit of God right now, church, is in our midst. And because he's here, anything can happen. We are a temple, a place inhabited by the presence of God, and so where God is, the impossible becomes irrelevant. Miracles become normal. Salvation should be every day. Unbelievers should come into these gathered moments, as I believe they do, and experience the power and the presence of God and leave saying, as Paul writes, surely God is among you. Don't we long for an environment like that? Don't we long to move beyond the ordinary Christian life where we come, sing a few songs, go home? Don't we long for an encounter with the risen Christ? Don't we long for the things in the Bible to become reality and become normal? Don't we long to see uh, the, the deaf hear? Don't we long to see the blind have their eyes open? Don't we long to say the kingdom of God come in our time? Just me. No. And here's the challenge. How many of you know that it's possible to ignore the Spirit of God in our midst? It's possible to resist the Spirit of God in our midst or even grieve the Spirit of God in our midst. Someone once said that if God took the Holy Spirit from the church, 95% of churches would carry on as though nothing had changed. My heart for this house is that we'd be in the 5%. Nothing works without Him and His presence. And while it's possible to grieve and resist the Spirit of God, I also believe it's possible, and I think it's God's desire, to create such a culture here in this church, such an atmosphere of hunger and desperation and longing and devotion that the Spirit of God shows up in great power and increasing power as we gather in a way that um, changes everything for people. John Tyson said this, God comes where, he wa- where he's wanted. So being a temple means creating environments where God is wanted. Living as a temple means being actively aware of his presence among us and giving God permission to do whatever he wants to do. It means that whatever we're doing here on a Sunday, before the service has even started, God is in the midst of us. This means when people step over the threshold of our site and get welcomed by the car park team, We have an expectation that anything can happen. People could come under the conviction of sin and a revelation of God's goodness, come to faith just because someone held a board saying, great to see you at church. We've got to raise our expectations of what this means when we live and operate as a temple. Before the service even begins, as saints, as priests, we're asking the Father, Lord, what are you doing here today? We're here not to consume, we're here to serve. Who who do you have a word for that I can share with? Who can I encourage? Who can I be generous to? This is how the early church operated. They didn't have lights and cameras and anything like that. They were just on mission knowing they lived and operated as a temple. The presence of God was with them. And we get to partner in extended his kingdom in our time. Being a temple means that the presence of God is our highest priority. And it means that all of our activity is to that end. It means that our worship lays a table for him to come. It means that the preaching of the word glorifies and magnifies the risen Christ so that others can come to know him and we can grow in our love for him. Our prayer times, our ministry times usher people into encounter with the power of God. Our welcome team reaches into brokenness and desperation, calls people home. Our cameras and media are prophetic pictures streaming to the world about a a new way to live and a hope that is eternal. Every moment is a place to call people home. Last week, I had stunning stories that at least 12 people gave their lives to Christ at our Easter Sunday services. Isn't that awesome? I had a story of um, someone sharing a prophetic word with um, some people who just started coming to church. 
before the service had begun, on the way into the auditorium, they just uh, experienced the presence of God, began to cry. When we operate as a temple in a naturally supernatural way, we get to partner with God, we become aware of his presence, get to partner with him in bringing heaven to earth and inviting people home. Theologian Gordon Fee writes in a commentary on this passage that Paul is here reflecting on the church as the corporate place of God's dwelling, who when we gather in Jesus' names, we get to experience the presence and the power of the Lord Jesus in our midst. Again, he says, the spirit is the key, the crucial reality for life in the new era. The presence of the spirit and that alone marks them off as God's new people, God's temple, when assembled in Christ's name in Corinth. And church, it's the same for us in Hull. We could have the best band in the world, the best preachers, the best lights, the best sound and coffee, but what sets us apart as God's temple is the experienced reality of God's power and presence among us. That is our inheritance. That is what we're gonna go after and hunger for forever. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, I, I think Paul in the... Uh, the verse after the one I've just unpacked um, gives us three ways that we can cultivate a temple culture. Three three things that we need to do in order to help us become and sustain what it means to be a temple. And uh, I want to just give those three before we pray for each other. Uh, Verse 16, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, key verse here, 17, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. My first reflection on this is that God's temple is to be guarded. God's temple is to be guarded. The enemy always attacks where the spirit of God is moving. The enemy's desire is that churches would cease to be temples and simply become social clubs. He has no issue with religion at all. The enemy likes religion. But he has a real issue with people who go after the presence of God. It's easy to run a great community center. You don't even need to be a Christian. In fact, there's a lot of amazing community centers in Hull doing brilliant stuff for the local community. You just need a bit of vision, drive, organization. But it's hard to be a temple because the enemy hates temples. And so Paul here, in what he's saying essentially, and he's doing through this letter, is he's teaching the church to guard our being a temple. He's fighting for God's vision for his house. He says if anyone causes damage to the church, there will be consequences. We have to guard the church. But I believe that actually he's not just saying guard the church. He's saying guard the reality that this is a temple. He says guard the temple. God, the place of his presence. God, the reality that God is in our midst. You know, a lot of Christians would get rid of that because it costs something to go after the presence of God. It costs something to step out there and allow him to, to take control of our meetings. It costs something. Remember John spoke a little while ago about God, just a sense that God is bringing revival in our time, but it's gonna cost the church to go after him and all that he has. So we're called to guard um, uh, guard the temple. Now, guarding speaks of uh, protecting what is precious and preventing what is toxic. Here are some things I believe we have to guard, protect, and contend for in our culture. Number one, uh, you can find these throughout the New Testament. Guard the gospel. Guard the main and the plain. Paul talks about this later in 1 Corinthians. And number two, guard sound doctrine. Number three, guard healthy culture. Number four, guard a heart for the lost. Number five, guard spiritual hunger. Number six, guard a heart for the poor. And number seven, guard a welcome for the dif- of the different. I could go on and there's so many things we could guard, but I just feel like those are some to get us started. We're called to guard ourselves, guard our lives, guard our godliness, guard our character, guard our walk with God. A couple of months ago, Stuart Bell brought a brilliant word in season for our church about God in the house of God, uh, house of God. And he talked about things that we need to protect the house from. And he spoke of guarding the house from these things. He spoke about opposing atmospheres and small-mindedness, and hidden agendas, and religious mindsets, and mean attitudes. I'd encourage you to go listen to it, it was brilliant. 
is a few other things to guard against as a community. Toxic leadership, division, immorality in the church, consumerism, idolatry, the culture of Corinth infiltrating the church. Paul says, guard the temple. Number two, God's temple is to be holy. Paul says this, guard the church because the temple is sacred. The word sacred speaks of holiness. It speaks of a set apartness. It speaks of a consecration, an alternative existence to to the prevailing culture around us. We cease to be a temple when when we begin to host the culture of the world over the culture of heaven. When we allow the things of our world around us to, to creep into the church, we stop being holy. Uh, and the Holy Spirit is a holy spirit. And he's looking for a holy people, a people who stand out, who are marked by the presence, who don't blend in with the world. We don't dim our lamps so not to cause offense. We don't shout at the darkness. We, we don't shun the darkness. We don't live the same as the darkness, but we shine in the darkness. We turn the lights on. That is what our culture needs. Our culture needs these gathering moments to be so full and pregnant of the power of God. We can then take that to a hurting world and invite people home. We live not as thermometers, which simply tell us what the temperature is in the the room around us, but we live as thermostats, which set the temperature. And that is what God is looking for in our time from our church. Philippians 2, Paul calls us to become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you'll shine among them like stars in the sky. Church is called to shine like stars in the sky. So we're called to guard the temple. That God's temple is called to be holy. And finally, Paul says God's temple is to be united. Paul says this, you together are that temple. He's already spoken about disunity. Let me say, when the church is united, that is a magnet for favor. Paul says, you together are that temple, not individually, not on our own. Paul will get to that later, but together, as you gather, this is a unique, special environment where God can dwell and wants to dwell among us in great power. Isn't that remarkable? I wonder if we wake up in the morning on a Sunday or a Monday at prayer gatherings or when we go to home group and we think, hey, where the church is gathered, the Spirit of God is our midst and that changes everything. Because we are a temple. You are a temple, church. We become a place when we gather where heaven and earth overlaps, a place where anything can happen, a place where the Spirit of God moves and speaks and Jesus is present in a unique way. Whenever we gather, the Spirit of God is in our midst, and that means now. Amen?